Good morning and good evening, church. It is a blessing to be able to open God's Word again. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Forgive and forget. Question mark. If you have your Bibles in front of you, please do turn to Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12 and follow along. If you don't have your Bibles in front of you, please pause the video, grab your Bible, download the Bible app, on your phone and follow along with me. And if you want a physical copy, please feel free to uh, have a chat with me, me, text me, email me. I'm happy to uh, give you a Bible to keep. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Reading from verse 1. This is God's word. And when he entered, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And merely Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Amen. That was God's word. Let's pray. God, our Father, we need your help right now. Wherever we are, we need your help. We need your spirit to be working in our lives, to be transforming us as we hear and try to understand your word. Father, open our eyes to the truth of your word. Father, transform our hearts for your glory's sake. Lord, help us not to leave today unchanged. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, forgiveness, a very big topic. I'm sure all of you have been hurt in one way or another. Maybe a brother or sister has said mean things to you, done mean things to you. Maybe a husband or wife has disappointed you, betrayed you. Maybe a friend has done something which you will never forget. Very often, especially as Christians, we say, you need to forgive. Sometimes we say, forgive and forget. Don't remember it. Forgiveness. The problem with with forgiveness is when we start talking about it, we often misunderstand what forgiveness is all about. It is often viewed from a moralistic, standpoint, a moralistic perspective. Non-Christians can talk about forgiveness. And what happens is, when we start talking about forgiveness in the Bible, we don't understand it from a biblical perspective, especially as 21st century people. We don't understand the weight and the importance of forgiveness in Scripture. We, We are going to deal with the forgiveness of sins more specifically today. Since the forgiveness of sins is a central theme of the Bible and we need to get it right. We need to get forgiveness of sins right. Our text today in Mark chapter 2 is the story of Jesus healing a paralytic man because of the faith of the four men who carried him and dug Uh, through the roof to bring him to Jesus. This particular story answers a very important question. Who can forgive 
your sins. Who can forgive your sins? That is a very important question. But before we look at the answer, I want to clarify some presuppositions. I want to clarify a few things. I want to go back to the basics because the people in Jesus' day would have had a clear understanding of forgiveness of sins. But we as 21st century people often don't. We need to get it right. And so I want to do something slightly different today than previous weeks. I want to see what the Bible has to say about forgiveness of sins, and we're gonna, and then we're gonna look at the text, okay? And we're gonna do that by answering three questions. Number one, what is forgiveness of sins? Number two, why do you need forgiveness of sins? And then number three, our main question, who can forgive sins? What is forgiveness of sins? Why do you need forgiveness of sins? Who can forgive sins? You will need your Bible, like always in front of you. We're going to be jumping to a few different texts to answer these questions. And so firstly, we're going to answer the first two questions together. What is forgiveness of sins and why do you need forgiveness of sins? I read earlier today, Psychology Today says, forgiveness is the release of resentment or anger. Forgiveness is eternal, internal, and the process does not hinge on the offender offering an apology or reconciling afterwards. Psychology Today says, forgiveness is the release of resentment or anger. It is internal. It's something inside. And the process does not hinge on the offender offering an apology or reconciling afterwards. Does their definition of forgiveness do justice to biblical forgiveness? Maybe you like what they have to say. But does it answer our questions? Is the forgiveness of sin just a release of God's anger? And is it an internal process that God does, which does not hinge on the offender offering an apology or reconciling afterwards. I think there's some truth in what they have to say. But it's not a definition of biblical forgiveness, especially when we start thinking about forgiveness of sins. They've slightly missed the mark. You might hear people say, that is okay, God will forgive me of my sins. He is a good and loving God. Heinrich Hein was a German poet, a writer, and literary critic in the early to mid 1800s. And he said on his deathbed, God will forgive me, it's his job. Would God forgive Heinrich Hein? Would God forgive him without him doing anything? Is God in the business of forgiving? Well, when we start talking about forgiveness, we need to understand who we need forgiveness from. The Bible talks about our need for forgiveness from God. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin is cosmic treason. Sin describes our moral bankruptcy. It describes how you and I and the whole world fails to meet God's standards. Why does it matter? It matters because he is holy and perfect and he can't deal with anything but perfect holiness. He is the creator God and sin says that every single person rejects the creator God. Sin says that the whole world, you and I, your neighbors, your brothers, your sisters, your husband, your wives, your whole family, every single person in this world, no matter how morally good you might think you are, rejects God. He is the creator God and sin says that we don't give what God deserves. Ask yourself today, ask yourself very honestly, does God take first priority in my life? Ask yourself today, are you morally perfect in God's standards? Do you lust? Do you envy? Do you covet? 
Do you lie? Do you get angry, impatient? Do you worship God and honor God in everything that you do? Well, maybe today you do. Maybe today you're morally perfect. Maybe today you put God first. But how about yesterday? How about the day before? How about tomorrow or the days after? Every single person in this world does not meet God's standards. And in fact, we are enemies of God. Every single person is disobedient to God when instead he requires perfect disobedience, when he requires perfect obedience. Sin is committing crime against holy and just God. You know, when we go to Isaiah chapter 59, open your Bibles to Isaiah 59. It describes God's goodness and grace, but also describes the seriousness of sin. Isaiah 59 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. So God is able to do something. God is able able to save. Look at verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Can you see that? Sin causes separation from God. And the problem with sin is that there is an ultimate punishment. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Punishment, which is made clear from the very beginning of time. At the fall, sin equals death, eternal judgment, because it is high treason against the Creator God. So what is forgiveness of sins? Why do you need it? Forgiveness of sins is when God pardons you from your high treason. It is when God pardons you from your sins. It is when God sets aside your disobedience and your corruption. It is when He doesn't count what you do against Him. It is when God puts away puts aside your moral bankruptcy. And you need it because you are a sinner. And unless God forgives you, unless God forgives you of your sins, you will continue to have this broken relationship with the perfect and glorious and loving Heavenly Father. And you will stand condemned before Him. Sin separates you from God. We need the forgiveness of sins because it fixes that relationship. And so there's two parts of that answer. You will continue to have a broken relationship with the perfect and glorious Heavenly Father, and you will stand condemned before Him if your sins aren't forgiven. You know, psychology today, when I was reading it in that same article, they make a distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation. But the Christian worldview puts them together because when God forgives you and me, He reconciles that relationship. He reconciles us to Himself. The great thing is Hebrews 8.12, if you turn with me, Hebrews 8.12 says this, For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Hebrews 8.12 tells us, in one sense, God forgives and forgets our sins. But He doesn't technically forget it completely, like how we might forget our keys or our phones and can't remember where we put it. He is omniscious, meaning He knows everything, past, present, and future. When God forgives our sins and He forgets it, quote-unquote, it means that God will never call our sins to mind on the grounds for our condemnation. It doesn't mean sin is not a problem. It just means that our rebellion against God, our sins, will not be grounds for our condemnation before Him. God forgives and forgets. He doesn't call to mind our sins as our grounds for condemnation. So what is forgiveness of sins? God not counting our sins as grounds of of our condemnation. Why do you need it? You need it because you are a sinner 
and without God's forgiveness, you have a broken relationship with the perfect and glorious and loving Heavenly Father. And you will stand condemned before His throne. You will stand condemned before Him. An eternal death, hell will be waiting for you. That's what, that is what forgiveness is, and that's why you need it. The thing is, the Jews knew all this. It, the Jews knew it, it, was, it was common knowledge. In the 21st century, that, this, what we've just talked about, isn't common knowledge. They are clear on this. And so when we come to our passage in Mark chapter 2, right in the story of Jesus healing the paralytic man with paralysis, we will finally be able to understand the punchline we're going to answer the final and main question of the text. Who can forgive sins? If you remember from last week, Jesus has healed a man with leprosy. The scene has changed, and now in verse 1, it tells us, right, that he has returned to Capernaum after some days. News has spread. People have gathered to his house. Verse 2, many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. It's a full house. What's he doing there? Preaching. It's not a surprise. Jesus came as a preacher. And wouldn't it be great if our church was full to the brim because of the preaching? What happens next? Verse 3. And they came bringing to him a paralytic, paralytic carried by four men. There's four men who brought a paralytic to Jesus. But obviously, Obviously, what's happened is they've heard about Jesus, that he can heal, and they have faith that he could. We know they had faith for a number of reasons. The first reason is because they physically brought the man. The second reason is they went to great length by removing part of the roof to make an opening uh, for the paralytic to come to Jesus. They dug a hole on top of the roof big enough to lower the bed. And finally, in verse 3, we know they have faith because Jesus saw their faith, their faith, the men's faith. What happens next is Jesus encounters the paralytic. What would you expect? What would you expect to happen when the paralytic is lowered from the roof to Jesus? If you were part of the crowd and you were listening to Jesus and you suddenly see you know, a bit of dirt falling from the roof, and then you see a hole and a man comes down, a paralytic coming down. What would you expect Jesus to say? If you were the crowd or his friends, you would expect Jesus to say, be healed or rise. That's what you would expect. But instead, what does he do? Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. This is the confusing part of the story. Why does Jesus say, Son, your sins are forgiven? Jesus wants to make a point. He wants to make a point to the people there. He wants to make a point to us. The scribes seeing there in verse 7, uh, question in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Sin is cosmic treason, right? It is against God and therefore only God can forgive. The, the scribes seeing there understood the implications of Jesus' statements. The scribes seeing there are saying, he is claiming to be God. And that's exactly who Jesus is. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to prove here in this text. He is proving that he is from God. He is God. And that he has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus proves his point in verses 9 to 11. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Jesus tells us the purpose of what is happening here in verse 10. He does this so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. How does he prove that he is the answer to that question? 
to answer who can forgive sins? He does it with his statements. In face value, we can interpret what Jesus has to say in a variety of reasons. We're going to only take two of them for the sake of time. The first uh, way we can interpret what he says is this. Is Jesus saying that it is easier to speak the words he did because it is shorter? Your sins are forgiven in English and in Greek is four words. Rise, take up your bed and walk is seven in English, eight in Greek. Is Jesus saying that he wanted to use less words? I think that would be quite silly to think that. It would serve no purpose if that's all he was trying to say. If all he's trying to say is that I wanted to take the shorter sentence. That does not prove that Jesus has authority to forgive sins. So this is the second way. And I think this is what's happening here. In one sense, it is easier for Jesus to claim to say your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven is an easier claim. There is no way to prove it. It is harder from a human perspective to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Because if the man did not do it immediately, Jesus would be a fraud. A visible healing is hard evidence, whereas merely a verbal claim to forgive sins invites skepticism. It opens up doubt. But what Jesus does here is something that he does often in the Gospels. Jesus preaches, he makes a claim, and then he confirms the claim. He confirms the truths of his claim by proving it with a miracle. Only something that God can do. And that's exactly what he does here. He proves that he, that he is who he claims to be by his miracles. Verse 12, And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. They never saw anything like this because this is from God. Jesus does the harder claim. He does the miracle. He heals. And by doing this, right, he not only proves that he has authority to heal, that he is powerful, but he also proves that he has authority to forgive sins. Jesus does the harder claim to prove the easier claim. Why does he have authority? Jesus tells us why he has authority in verse 10. He gives himself the title, the Son of Man, because Jesus is the Son of Man. And the Son of Man points us to the Old Testament. It points us to Daniel 7. Now, normally, when we think about Daniel, we think about Daniel and the lion's den. The later few chapters have a lot of visions. It's a bit uh, cryptic. Daniel 7, the prophet Daniel records several of his visions while he was living in Babylon. In Daniel 7, 9 to 14, Daniel describes the vision he has of God Almighty, that God sits in judgment. What happens is the dominion of the earth is taken from the beasts and it's given to one like a son of man. This one becomes Lord of all and is given reign over all people, nations, and languages in a kingdom that will never, ever end. Daniel chapter 9, verse 13 to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man depicts Jesus' authority to heal and forgive is the title of the sovereign Lord, full of glory and power. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying he's that son of man. 
He's the one who has an eternal kingdom, who reigns supreme. Jesus ultimately does this on the cross where his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. He pays the penalty of sins and exchange. Those who have faith receive pardon and a reconciled relationship with God. That's what happens here. And so the question, the question is, who can forgive? There is only one person who can forgive. There's only one person who can forgive sins. It's not the Pope. It's not the priests. It's not your good works. Only the Son of Man. He is the one who has authority to forgive. Forgiveness is our greatest need. It is a greater problem than this man's paralysis. It doesn't really matter if this man stayed as a, paralysis, as a paralytic. The most important thing for him is whether or not his sins are forgiven. It is a greater problem than all the diseases of this world. It's a greater problem than corona, the coronavirus. It is a greater problem than depression, injustice, and even physical death. None of these things extend past eternity. Only your standing before God matters. Only your relationship with God matters. The most important thing for anyone in this world is whether, is whether or not you have your sins forgiven. You may have the good life now, but if you don't have your sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus, then it doesn't matter because you will spend eternity in hell. You will spend eternity condemned. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as the one who forgives you of your sins? This man was healed because of faith. Our sins are forgiven because of faith. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ, the one who, Who can forgive? Who can forgive the Son of Man, Jesus Christ? Amen. Let's pray. God, our Father, we're thankful for this story. This story answers a very important question, probably the most important question of the world. Who can forgive our sins? There's only one person, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, the one who forgives us of our sins, who has authority to forgive. He cleanses us, He washes us us, of our sins by His blood on the cross. And so, Father, we ask that Your Spirit would help us to look to Jesus. There are people here today who are listening to this sermon who are who are hearing your words who have not asked for forgiveness in jesus christ lord be working in their hearts opening their eyes to the glory and majesty and the beauty of jesus christ father for us some of us who have already put our trust in Jesus Christ, Lord, renew our passion and our love for the gospel. Fill our lives with joy in knowing that Jesus has authority to forgive sins. And nothing can take that away. Father, we're thankful for Jesus. He's the reason why we can spend every Sunday hearing your word. He's the reason why we can have a reconciled relationship with you. Help us to continue to trust in Jesus Christ for your glorious sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
to see.